let's start. So just before you can hear me. Isn't it? So welcome to the first Eustream conference. On behalf of the European Network of Swimming Performance at the University of Castilla-La Mancha, we welcome you to the first annual Congress of the EUSWIM. EUSWIM is an academic and research network whose aim is to develop and spread knowledge about swimming science. Whether you are a student, researcher, professor, our platform offers the opportunity to exchange, interact, and participate with us through our first annual conference. While the on-site Congress did not occur as a consequence of COVID-19 pandemic, the organizing committee thought that the online conference kickoffs the network in a safe and healthy way. We have created different committees for accomplishing the different tasks of the Congress, organizing committees, scientific committee, abstract book committee, as well as our web manager, Carlos Casas. A big thank you to all and to the Astra submitters for being part of this first edition of the conference. The European universities hosting USWIN 2021 from United Kingdom, Portugal, Spain, France, and Greece have worked hard in offering an outstanding scientific program that emphasizes contemporary knowledge in sports science. Our speakers are also outstanding researchers in swimming science, and I'm sure they provide the latest studies and findings from the last year of swimming performance. After the conference, we will publish the abstract book in open access, edited by Editorial Van Seulen in Spain that contains the whole scientific program. Once we finish the conference and the editor completes the book, we will submit online to our web page. Our first challenge of this network will be deciding our next step as a network and the forthcoming events to develop. I firmly believe this network was born to offer a valuable service to the swimming community. Special thanks to our colleagues from the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Turner and Dr. Sikarakis, who co-chaired the present and future direction of the Ilsing Network. I anticipate that the first annual Congress of the Swing will be an exceptional professional experience. On behalf of the Swing organizers, we wish you a productive conference online. Thank you very much. Now, I introduce to our first speaker, Dr. Ricardo Fernandez. He holds a position as associate professor at the University of Porto in Portugal. He is interested in of the biophysical characterization, especially centered on the availability and use of energy in cyclic sports, especially in swimming. He is author of 161 papers. So if uh, I have an update and Ricardo told me is 200 papers. So <laughs> deeply sorry, Ricardo. 
in different journals, most of them in journal citation reports, with a H index of 25. Today, he talks about swimming biomechanics, starting and turning. So he also has been coach, swimming coach, and currently he is master swimmer. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Fernandez. It is a great pleasure that now I give you the floor. Hello, I hope that you are hearing me okay. Can you okay. give me a sign if you are okay? Yes, okay. thank you. So my personal greetings to everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thanking to the Congress organizers, particularly to Professor Jose Maria Gave, uh, for having me today. It's also a big pleasure to be with all of you in this afternoon. Uh, you know that starts can have up to 30% of the total event duration, especially in short distance races. And turns occupies a significant part of long distance events with its optimization reducing times by at least 0 0.2 seconds per lap. This is very well documented since the 1980s. Starts and turns evolution in the last century was impressive. Even if coaches and researchers focus their attention mainly at different swimming techniques like front crawl or breaststroke, starts and turns also displayed significant importance in the swimmers' training, as well as in swimming science, mainly with the Biomechanics and Medicine in Swimming Symposium that was created in 1970s. Starts and turns evolution was related to better technical performances, but also to the selection of the best start technique to use. For example, when starting with an acoustic or with a visual stimulus, or when starting for a freestyle sprint race, comparing to a 1500 freestyle event. Of course, the start techniques used at ventral or dorsal events are also different. In the same way, swimmers use different turning techniques. For instance, in breaststroke and butterfly events, they use the open turn, and in freestyle and backstroke races, they use the rollover turn. However, this notable evolution along the years is also related to changes in the FINA rules. In the first Olympic Games, swimmers started from the deck or from the front wall, and only after some years, the starting block was introduced. Regarding the backstroke start, for example, it was mandatory that swimmers' feet to be placed under the surface of the water. Some years later, feet could be placed above the water surface, and there are a number of studies available for people that want to study in more detail this variability. More recently, the starting block was modified as we are going to see in this video. I hope that the sound can be heard by you. If not, please try to put it a little bit higher. Okay. 
stone condition at Waterford that is adjustable to four additional positions in two centimeter increments above the surface of the water and also below the surface of the water. David Palmer might have slipped off the glass and did slip on a terrible stone. But a lot of things can happen to you. That was a truly exceptional event in the boat people's world. That's what it could be. I, I, I think that uh, So, uh, at the University of Porto, uh, we are also very interested on in making a biomechanical analysis of the starts and turns. So, we have developed a dynamometric central that tries to mimic a starting OSB11 implemented block, allowing the performance of all non swimming starts in almost all non conditions and discriminating each limb action and the whole body mechanics. For this purpose, we have started by doing the design and construction of a three-dimensional force plate prototype that later allow it to be the base of the instrumented starting and turning block. This is the block that we use for biomechanical evaluation of starts and turns. This block has seven force plates and prehensile sensors, allowing differentiating the front right and left foot, the rear foot, the right and left hands, and the right and left foot for backstroke starts. These are the different feet positions that we can use for different ventral starting techniques. And in fact, in this block, you, we can evaluate the different positions using, for instance, the track start or the grab start, or even uh, studying the moving starts used in relays using when, uh, one step or two steps forward, and so on and so, on and so forth. So we have a, a number of possibilities to evaluate the different uh, techniques. This is uh, the experimental data setup that uh, usually we use in our swimming pool. It's very important to well position the different cameras since we use several land and underwater cameras, as well as to calibrate the space that we are going to use. First, we do a static and then a dynamic under and over the water calibration. This is an example of a relay data collection that we have done, and we can also use some electromyography data, as we, you can see here, from eight different muscular groups. The back plate for the rear foot has different positions that swimmer can try, can experiment, and then select the one that he or her wants to use during practice or during competition. Next, we will show one example of the outputs that we can obtain in the backstroke start we are seeing now. Uh, we can see some kinetic uh, kinematic values and uh, we can see also the swimmer's displacement through a reconstruction of different relevant body points that we mark in each uh, swimmer. We have experience in evaluating age group swimmers, junior, senior, and elite swimmers from different countries. And we have also started to evaluate handicapped swimmers. We think it's also very important to evaluate this population. Now we are presenting one example of a biomechanical start data analysis. In this, in this case, in this very specific case, for the backstroke starts. And as you can see, uh, we usually analyze the different phases of the start using different methods. So for the hands-off takeoff flight and entry, we use the force plates and 3D digital video. But for the underwater path, 
usually we use a 3D opto electronic system. This slide presents uh, one example of data uh, related with the effects of different foot uh, positions. So the foot, the feet completely immersed, partially immersed or completely immersed. And also the different hands setup position. You can see here the lowest horizontal hand grip, a highest horizontal hand grip, and a vertical hand grip. It is, is only one example of a kinetic relate variables. In this case, the lower limbs, horizontal impulse. We can observe higher values in the emerged feed condition, independently of the hands setup positioning that the swimmer used. If you want to have more details about this study, please enter this site and try to find this, this paper. If you have any difficulty, please send me an email and I will send it to you without any problem. As an example of a kinematic relate variable, we show here the 50 meter start time. Here we can observe similar results for the three feet positions, so similar results, but always with a tendency for worst results for the lowest horizontal hand grip. This means that when the swimmer uses this lowest horizontal hand grip, he always is slower independently of having the, the feet immersed, partially immersed or completely immersed. Now this, this slide refers to the overall performance related variables and what is their behavior along the different phases. So this is the time and of course, we have here different phases of the start, okay? In the upper panel here, you can observe the vertical displacement of the lower limbs, okay? In this, far, in this phase, a higher vertical displacement and then a lower vertical displacement. In the middle panel, we can observe the vertical displacement of the center of mass here, the center of mass and what happens during the different phases. And here in below, uh, we can observe evidences of the changes of the vertical velocity of the center of mass. These are only examples of variables that we can use to characterize our swimmers. So very, very fast, uh, we would like now to present some practical applications for, for coaches. When not disposing of a wedge, positioning feet partially or completely immersed is a great advantage, mainly for the hands-off and takeoff phases. But using the lowest horizontal end grip is not so good. It will jeopardize somehow the flight. Using vertical end grips and the feet on the wedge vertical end grips and the feet on the wedge will allow a greater takeoff angle, which is good. Also, a higher center of mass vertical position during the flight and center of mass velocity during immersion. This will allow that swimmers will have a less resistant flight, reducing deceleration. And the coaches will want for sure that the swimmer's flight will be not so resistant, so the velocity will be higher. Uh, lastly, swimmers should prioritize a completely out of the water body setup position, as you can see here, the feet emerged and uh, highest hand grip position. Uh, this will allow to minimize water resistance during flight and entry, to generate a proper balance between horizontal and vertical impulse. That is also important to have a good combination between horizontal and vertical impulse. 
and will allow the body velocity to decrease the less possible during the gliding also. Now we will jump, because we don't have much time, to uh, swimming turns experimental data setup. So regarding the biomechanical analysis of the turning phase, we show in this video, only as an example, the data setup for the backstroke to breaststroke turn characterization. We did this study using the quality system for assessing swimmers' kinematics. We have used 23 cameras, 12 land cameras plus 11 underwater cameras. And we have also used several tracking body markers. As you are going to see in the, in the swimmers, they have a lot of markers. You can see here, we have used 51 body markers. We have used the instrumented starting and turning block, as you are seeing here, for assessing kinetic relate variables. And this is a nice image of the backstroke to breaststroke turning. We have also assessed electromyographic activity using surface EMG and also hydrodynamic variables uh, assess it through inverse dynamics. In this particular study, we have a close collaboration with coaches because the swimmers were very young and it was required that they trained previously for different backstroke to breaststroke turns. As it was an intervention study, they were evaluate, evaluated pre and post four weeks of training. So during these four weeks of training, they have trained these different techniques in 16 contextual interference sessions. During the practice, we went to the club and in each practice, we took 20 minutes to train with them these different techniques. And these are the, the, the different techniques uh, as you are seeing here. So the, the open turn, is the, probably the, the technique that is mostly used, okay? And this somersault turn is also very, very frequent to, to be seen, particularly by young swimmers. Then we have the bucket turn, where it seems very similar to the open turn, but in fact, uh, during the, the touch in the wall, during the rotation, the lower limbs travel outside of the water, okay? And the back stays parallel to the bottom of the pool. And here, no, here the trunk is on the side. So we have the difference on the lower limbs and on the back. And uh, inclusively, after the, the push off, uh, a long time, the, the swimmer stays in a lateral position. Uh, only then uh, he, he or she rotates to ventral. And here the rotation to ventral is almost automatic. The crossover uh, technique is a modification of the somersault. Okay. Uh, it has uh, a modified somersault technique with some technical aspects of the open. And this is a, a very fast technique that we see on elite swimmers, but on age group, it's not so common uh, to, to observe. In fact, each swimming technique, in each swimming technique, there are several indicators that we should consider. Please observe that here we can see the turn in, the rotation, the wall contact, and the pull out. And each one of these phases inside the, the turn has different variables that we should train, that we should evaluate, that we should give feedbacks. So the turn, the turning movement is also a rather complex uh, movement, as you can see in this diagram. It's not a simple, a simple motion. So we have aimed also to, to, to have that and to share that with the, with the coaches. And firstly, we aim to study how some hydrodynamic relate variables, like the swimmer's drag, 
like the drag, the drag coefficient and the body sectional area might differ uh, in the different backstroke to breaststroke techniques. Uh, just to, to be clear, these, the, the body section, sectional area uh, was evaluated in the first gliding position. So when the swimmer push off the wall <clears throat> during the gliding in the first position, he and she or she, they are like this, but in the second gliding position, they glide in this, in this position, okay? So the data that I will share with you is referred to the first position and to the second position. So we have observed higher drag forces and also higher drag coefficient values for the second gliding position comparing to the first one in all the swimming techniques. If you see here, you can see that in the second gliding position, the drag is always, always higher than the first, as well as the drag coefficient. In the different uh, swimming uh, turning uh, techniques, it's also always higher than in the first in the first gliding position. And this is true even if the velocity values are similar. Okay. What is the explanation? We think that this is, uh, sorry, this is explained by the fact that the swimmers have a higher cross-sectional area here in the second gliding position comparing to the first one. So it's really very important the anthropometrics of the swimmer and the hydrodynamic position the swimmers can assume when they are gliding. Then, we have focused on some kinetics relate variables. And these are some examples of variables that we can obtain using force platforms, etc. We have observed that the crossover turn revealed the highest push off velocity. That is really an important variable to evaluate during turns. And we have observed also that the somersault uh, turn uh, presented the higher foot plant uh, index. And just to be clear, the, the foot plant uh, index is the ratio, the division between the depths of the foot on the wall at the beginning of the push off, divided by swimmers lower limbs length. It's uh, relevant. Uh, ratio that uh, we can uh, we can observe in research, and this 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 fact can affect the first gliding transition and second gliding depths because, as you know, the variables are relate, related with uh, each other. So it's important to have this in mind. Uh, the data also uh, revealed the consistency of the breakout distance and breakout time between all the techniques. If you can see here the breakout, breakout distance, it's very similar between the different uh, turning techniques. Of course, we don't have statistical differences. In terms of time, they are not the same, but they are not significant distance, different, as well as the breakout time. And we have also observed no differences between the different uh, turning techniques regarding the, the time and average velocity up to the 7.5 meter mark. That is also a distance uh, that the, the trainers, the, the coaches want to, to evaluate when they are training and uh, monitoring the, the turns. In terms of practical applications, uh, we should say that hydrodynamic variables are really uh, very relevant for all the backstroke to breaststroke turning techniques in age group swimmers, but were independent of the selected uh, technique. Kinematic temporal variables are determinant during turn in, during the, this phase, the approach to the wall. And the kinetic variables gain uh, a particular relevance during the, the turnout, so during the push-off and the glide. 
the rotation and push-off phases are performance determinants for all the studied back to breaststroke turns in this particular population that we have studied, so the age group swimmers. The 50 meter turning time for all turns, all the turns, the fourth, improved more or less between four to five percent only in four weeks. So during a four weeks intervention period, we can we were able to obtain an interesting uh, increase in performance in somersault, open, crossover, and bucket, uh, bucket turns. Lastly, it appears that an intervention program could facilitate the learning of the learning and the, 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 the achievement of best performance of the back to breast turning techniques. But this four, four weeks, one month, one mesocycle was not sufficient to allow classifying one of the techniques as the most important or the best for the group. The training stimulus was not enough. We don't know if uh, uh, we did not four weeks, eight weeks or 12, if the things would be different, we don't know. But we were very glad that the swimmers enjoyed participating in this study. Uh, they were uh, all from the same club. The coaches were very pleased to, to have the swimmers involved in this, in this study. We went to the club to do the practical sessions and the swimmers came to the faculty before the practical sessions and after the practical sessions to make the comparison. It was really very nice and uh, we acknowledge very much the participation of the swimmers and the coaches. Lastly, because I think I have one or two minutes, I would like to, to share with you a very, very interesting uh, study that was published, I think, two weeks ago, or more or less like that, a study from uh, Ross Sanders, Hideki Takaji, and João Paulo Villas Boas, that is available on sports biomechanics. And uh, it is about uh, how can the technique help swimmers to be faster on the 100 meters front crawl. And uh, I have uh, made here a picture with some studies that they use it in their review, where they show that this, some components of the start, uh, for instance, reaction time, reaction time the block technique, the takeoff variables, the flight, etc. There are, uh, we have available studies, they are here, where the researchers focused only on these very specific segments of the race. So it's a very nice study where you can see data from the start and also data from the turning. Okay. Uh, some, some studies are, have. 20 years, other studies are from the last year. So it's a really very nice study to, to be seen. And a study where we can observe that, okay, 100 meters freestyle depends on starting, turning, swimming and finishing, sure, of course. But as you can see here, 26% of the performance depends on the starting. And almost 40% depends on turning. So if we join 26 with 14, we have 40% of 100 meters front curl depending on starting and on turning. So it's really important that the coaches do not focus only on the swimming techniques, but also on the starting techniques, on the turning techniques, and that they do not uh, use only the starts and turns two weeks before the competition. Please try to, to train the starts and turns along all the year, giving uh, some space, some time to do exercises, eventually filming the, the swimmers and showing them and giving feedbacks because these parts of the, the events are really, really important. I hope that you, you enjoyed uh, my speech. I hope that I was clear. 
And uh, once more, thank you very much for having me. So, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, oh, Ricardo. So I don't know if our audience have any questions. So if anyone have any questions, so first of all, just introduce you your position uh, afterward you can ask to Dr. Fernandez. Uh, sorry, I don't have photo, but I will introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Yelena Stosic and uh, I recently obtained a PhD. My supervisor was Santiago Viega, Professor Santiago Viega. So I'm very happy I I joined this event and thank you very much for this great presentation. Uh, especially it's interesting last longitudinal study. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think uh, that if you use a more experienced swimmer, these were age swimmers, that uh, you would maybe get different results in terms that there will be some differentiation in terms of uh, you we all see that uh, like starting a uh, turning technique like whether it's so much so uh, any of them did not specifically change the velocity so do you think it is just due to a uh, swimmer's age and because they did not, maybe they are not specialized. They use uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, open turning, sometimes some other turning. Would be that would be be the case, or can you comment on that, please? I hope I was clear. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. Thank you very much for for your question, and it was a very nice question for sure. Um, let me start by saying that they were not uh, trained in the four techniques. In fact, they were trained in only one of the techniques. That is the technique that they learn when they are very, very young. Uh, at least in Portugal, we are used to touch the wall, to push, uh, push our lower, lower limbs behind and to, to do a rollover turn to the, to the back. And this, uh, this is the, usually the, the turning technique that uh, they are used to. And why they are not used, for instance, to do the open turn? Because when they, they touch the wall, sometimes they are ventral. And if they are ventral, they will be dis disqualified. As you know, they need to touch the wall in the dorsal position. So the coaches, as they are very young, they do not... Uh, uh, teach them the open turn because they are afraid that the swimmers will be disqualified. The question is, should we not give a good motor uh, repertoire to our swimmers? Should we not train them in different techniques and then wait for them to specialize after this phase? These swimmers were 11, 12, 13 years old. If they know how to turn in four ways, after this, probably they can select the best, the best technique to use. And uh, well, this, this is our point of view. Regarding the fact if they are, uh, if they were uh, older, they could have different results. I'm sure that probably the results will be different. But the question is that I didn't spoke. Uh, should the different techniques, the turning techniques, be uh, well optimized, well combined with the anthropometrics of the swimmers? Because you know, probably you are a PhD on swimming, so you know, 
that uh, the, the swimmers that are very tall can have some difficulties of doing the rotation if they are they select this position. So maybe the open turn will be easier for them because they are very large, they, they are very tall. So what I can say to you, I don't have data comparing in these four situations and a group older than this, but I suspect that the results will be different, mainly because they will specialize in a very uh, specific the turning technique, and if then they compare with the others, of course, the others will be lower in terms of performance than the, the technique that they are using since 10, 12 or 15 years ago. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, thank you for your question, Jelena. So you're right, Ricardo. She defends, she defended her PhD this year, if I rem if I remember. Uh, so is that a, yes. is that right? Yes, correct. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. A very interesting doctoral thesis. So any more questions? Uh, Professor Jose Maria, if, uh, if anybody wants to, to speak in Spanish, uh, I can understand, there is no problem. So, yeah, but the problem is we have, we have attendance of different countries. Yes. So it could be a problem for English or Greek even French speakers. So, <laughs> any more questions? If can can I say something? Yes, of course. I would only like to say this. Uh, in my examples, of course, I have selected the data collections that we do in our facilities in the university, but. I know that these these materials we don't have them at the clubs, for sure. We don't have twenty cameras at the clubs. But even if we don't have twenty cameras, but if we have one GoPro camera, we can do nice technical assessments for starts and turns. It's better to, to do that than to do nothing. Okay. So if the coaches. Please do not be afraid and say, oh, I don't have 20 cameras. No problem. We can do a number of very interesting things only with, with one camera, okay? So please go, go for with it. If you like technical analysis, please use it. Use it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ricardo Fernandez for, for your speech and for your comment. So we're running out of time and uh, now so i don't know how to clap here in, <laughs> in this online session thank you no need for clapping <laughs> oh everybody's clapping with their hands thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much now our next speaker is Dr. Santiago Vega. So, Santiago holds a position as associate professor at the Technical University of Madrid in Spain. So, he was the head coach of Jaws swimming team in Spain from 2017 and 2021, and coach of the Olympic semifinalist and world junior champion Hugo González de Oliveira, besides other international medalists. In 2015, he was awarded as the best swimming coach by the Spanish National Swimming Coaches Association. So 
in the mean, uh, in the while he holds a position as coach, he developed uh, an academic career as a part-time associate professor at the Technical University of Madrid for 2011 to the present in the areas of sports, biomechanics, and skill acquisition. Now, He's, a, he, he's an associate professor in the specific course of swimming, if, if I'm right. So, Santi, are you online here? Um, <coughs> thank you, Chema. Thank you very much for the, <laughs> for the presentation. So, my pleasure. I'm going to share the screen for the PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay, so I think you can see my presentation. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank, first of all, the, the organizing committee and especially Professor Gonzalez Rave for inviting me to this presentation today and for giving me the, the opportunity of presenting our research in, in front of a large audience. So it's a pleasure for me and hope you enjoy the, the session. My presentation is about the rationale behind the start, turn, free swimming and finish section, which are the sections that we usually employ to evaluate uh, swimming races. These are the four parts of, the, of my presentation. I will start talking about uh, the more traditional procedures for swimming race analysis when we look at the at the literature on the topic, we see that the procedures employed has been mainly focused on fixed distance, which consists on temporal, temporal measurements from the starting or turning wall to fixed distance, usually at 15 meters or 10 or, or 7.5, depending on the aim of the study from the starting or turning wall. In this way, we have the time that swimmers spend to, to reach that point and we can make and we can make comparison between swimmers and in this way evaluate the, the performance in a specific parts of the race. The rationale behind dividing the total race in these segments depends on uh, that swimmers do different type of movements like in the start and turn they perform acyclic movements Whereas on the on the free swimming they, on, or the surface swimming, they do cyclic movements on the water surface. So it is interesting for coaches and researchers to analyze uh, separately the cyclic movements of the start and turn from the cyclic movements of the free swimming. We know that the, the skill in the free swimming, it, it, it has not to be the same skill during starting on turning. That's why it's, it's interesting to do different evaluation. But uh, as we know, uh, in elite competition, in senior level, junior level, at international level, there are uh, very tight margins between medals or between getting into the final or not. And that's why the evaluation procedures in competition keep evolving. In the last years, there has been uh, different examples of individual distance measurements. And I mean individual distance, like researchers uh, measuring the exact distance traveled by, by swimmers during underwater uh, segments of the race. In this way, we actually know how long swimmers travel underwater before they emerge for the surface swimming. In the sports biomechanics laboratory of the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, we, we we have made some publications about this topic that I'm going to present now in, 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 the, in the following slides. And we began with a proposal in 2013 of, it is not a new procedure because this, this was based on previous work uh, made in Sydney Olympic Games by, by Australian colleagues, but it was a proposal for swimming race analysis based on individual measurements. 
Um, the origin of this method that we propose was our previous work in soccer, as we analyze in different World Cups with the, with the FIFA, um, the activity of referees and the distance from the referee to the uh, players in different moments of the matches. So that gave us the idea to measure individual distance in the water surface during the race. In this way, we could know how long the swimmers travel underwater or how long do they progress in each stroke. The, the, method, the, the technique we use was based on the two-dimensional DLT. Uh, it is a technique that allows to correct the image perspective or the image distortion when we put the camera on the public stance, that is the, 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 the usually uh, the common uh, way to, to do race analysis. When we do that, when we do, do that uh, image is um, the format and the size of the lane close to the camera is much uh, great, is bigger than the lane far from the camera. That's why we need to correct that perspective. And this technique, the, the two-dimensional DLT, allows to correct and, and to, to do the individual measurements of distance. For that, we need some calibration points that we usually, we usually employ as color boys uh, uh, belonging to the floating lanes, as you can see in the image. And that allows us to calibrate the space and to create a, a plane of moving, movement formed by the water surface. We can control any point within the water surface. The rationale to do that, the reason to do this individual distance is that in a deterministic model, in a classical deterministic model of swimming performance result, we know that most of the performance determinants, uh, and they are not fixed distance, you know, swimmers, travel different distance in its uh, parameter depending on, on his or her own characteristics. That's why it's interesting to do, to do these individual measurements during the race. We know that the part of the race with the biggest impact on, on start performance or third performance is underwater. And the only way to measure underwater or to evaluate underwater in an accurate way is to individual me to exactly measure the distance travel and the time employed in that sector. First, st first step that we did when we proposed the method of individual distance was to validate it, to check the accuracy and the rel reliability um, when detecting in a video the hand entry or the head immersion of the swimmers in a, a standard competition. And we published the, these results some years ago about the accuracy and also the reli reliability of, of repeated digitalization of the images. And we compare 50 meter times, the traditional starting and turning times with the times and velocities to the moment of immersion, like 50 meter starting and 50 meter uh, turning to the uh, individual distance start and turn to the moment or to the instant of immersion. And we saw that correlations were not perfect. That told us that um, measuring the individual distance could give us additional information from the 15 meter time because the information was not uh, the same having the individual distance will give us additional information. That's why we thought it, it was uh, a, a useful uh, method for race analysis. After that, we had the chance to, to access to race footage from international competitions, both in, in Barcelona World Swimming Championships, in London Paralympic Games, and then in, in some other competitions. And we tried to solve or to um, find out uh, answers to some questions interesting for both coaches and researchers. The first question was, how long do elite swimmers or how long do uh, national level swimmers or regional level swimmers travel underwater? Do they travel 15 meters? We know when, when we see competitions, we know that they don't travel, all of them, they don't travel 15 meters. So we wanted to know exactly what was the, the typical and the water distance for different levels. These are results from World Swimming Championships. And as you see, 
freestyle di underwater distance are shorter than in the rest uh, of strokes, and that's normal because the surface swimming velocity is faster in, in, in front crawl. And these are results for national and regional level swimmers. And, and if you compare both graphs corresponding to different publications, you will see that uh, elite level swimmers travel between one and two meters longer in its starts and turns underwater than national or regional level swimmers. Of course, the tendency is that the underwater distance are increasing. And year by year, then the water distance, the swimmers travel closest, closer to the 15 meter mark, which is the limit from the, the FINA rules. Second question that we tried to answer was, once we know how long do swimmers travel, the second question was, if it is important to travel longer, do faster swimmers travel longer underwater? We wanted to know this. And we we saw we seek for relationships between the, the distance and velocities underwater with the end race result and we did that during world swimming championships and we saw that in 100 meter events underwater distance were not they didn't have an important impact on race, on race result when comparing between finalists and semi-finalists in that in that world swimming championships the most important parameter for the, for the 100 meter was the starting velocity and turning velocity to the point of immersion, not the distance. But on the 200 meter events, turning distance was much more important, important than average velocity. So it was a different, a different trend between the 100 and the 200 meter events. Uh, third question that we tried to solve was how then the water swimming evolved through the race. Okay, we know how then the water distance and are in 100 meter events during the start and turn, and we want to know how this changed through the, through the race. So we examine 200 meter events where swimmers have three turns, and these are data from each turn, the first, the second, and the third. And we saw that elite swimmers usually travel between half and one meter less in each turn, in each turn, which could could correspond to one kick less, one underwater kick less. Also, it could correspond to shorter gl uh, gliding. We don't know that, but that's our our hypothesis. Hypothesis. Very interestingly, we saw that in backstroke and in butterfly, the the the, the events where swimmers uh, use underwater ondulatory techniques, um, they main, maintained on the water distance in the last turn. Elite swimmers maintained at the water distance in the last turn. They did not decrease the distance travel on the water. Um, very interestingly, we saw that the velocity on the water in the three turns did not decrease. You can see here the green line is the underwater velocity and the black line is the free swimming velocity or surface swimming velocity. When swimmers are fatigued along the race, they decrease the surface swimming velocity, but they do not decrease the underwater velocity, even though they are tired or they are fatigued. So that gives us, coaches and researchers give us an idea of the importance of the underwater swimmer swimming to maintain average lap velocity, because maybe a swimmer is, is fatigued and loses velocity on the surface, but he can compensate in the underwater. Of course, that must be trained, but that's uh, an interesting point for coaches. Another question was, uh, for how long it lasts the influence, of, the influence of underwater swimming? And this is connected to the title of my presentation because the, 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 the star turn seg segments should be measured until the instant where the influence of the dive or the influence of the turning uh, turn wall push off finishes. When, when the, the positive influence on velocity finishes, that's the point where, the, where we consider that the start or turn finishes. 
So we may, we wanted to 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 um, check if velocity after immersion was faster than in the mid pool swimming. You can see here an example of a video that we took in. As you can see here in the video, we have to measure it, but right after underwater, it looks like first strokes could be faster, or maybe the stroke and rate could be faster than in the, in the middle of the race. This is a 50 meter uh, event, butterfly. And you know we can guess what happens, but we wanted to measure it. So we did it also with data from World Swimming Championship ships. And we saw that when analyzing 100 meter events in the first lap from the uh, starting dive, uh, the swimming velocity in the first strokes right after immersion was between five uh, and 10, uh, was, con was considerably, considerably faster than uh, in the middle of the pool, much faster in all strokes, but breaststroke. In breaststroke, right after immersion, velocity was not faster than mid-pool swimming. That could be due to the pos uh, position of the uh, underwater pullout in, in breaststroke and the, and the higher drag forces that the swimmers encounter at, at that point. But in the second lap, after the turn wall, uh, the swim velocity after immersion was not faster than mid-pool swimming, in front crawl, no faster, in breaststroke, no faster, but it was faster in backstroke and butterfly. So in these events where the swimmer travel longer underwater with underwater kicking, they uh, got faster swimming right after immersion. So that's another important point for coaches because the positive impact of underwater on the average velocity could be not only when swimmers are underwater, but also when they began uh, surface swimming provided they do a good uh, transition or break. Also, we wanted to know how does underwater performance change from an individual and a relay event. So with a race footage from uh, uh, European Junior Swimming Championships, you know that now European Federation provides uh, teams with race footage from the competition. Uh, with very high quality. So we use those videos to compare swimmers who did individual 100 meter event and also did the same stroke in relays. So one um, swimmer who did 100 meter breaststroke in individual event and he swam the best stroke leg in the medley relay. So we compared then the water performance in the individual and the relay from the same swimmer. And surprisingly, we saw that flag distance and flag time was not longer with a rely start, despite the preparatory, preparatory movements on the block. And surprisingly, we saw that the water performance was worse in relay. And the water velocity was slower and the water distance was shorter in rely start compared to an individual event. Probably, results were influenced because a sample of the study were junior swimmers, even, even though they were competing in European Junior Swimming Championships, but they probably still, they did not dominate the, the relay technique. But this is a, 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 um, an important point for coaches that we have to train relay starts. Otherwise, the, the underwater performance will be worse because maybe the, the posture of the swimmer at entry is worse, or maybe swimmer is distracted with the other, other teams position and they do not focus on their underwater swimming. Uh, we also compared underwater part, uh, underwater swimming after the turn between individual and relay events and we did not find any difference. And finally, we also examine the the race segment distribution or the start and third distance in Paralympic swimming uh, from London Paralympic Games. And we found out that as expected, 
distance travel underwater were longer by swimmers with a uh, less severe uh, impairment. But interestingly, uh, swimmers um, with uh, the low, low physical impaired swimmers or functional classes, intellectual impaired and visual impaired swimmers, they did not show differences in the starting or turning distances. From now on, there, there are still plenty of questions that must be uh, responded, must be solved about swimming race analysis as procedures keep evolving. And in the last year, there, there are still a lot of publications about the, the topic. So in the next, next slides, I give some ideas of, of future perspectives in, in swimming race analysis. More questions that we want to answer in the future. What is the rationale for the finish section? Because sometimes race analysts measure the finish part of the race, but we don't know how long it, it, it lasts, the finish part. And, and, and the only rationale cannot be that the, the lanes change color and now they are red the last five meters. We don't know if the, if the, the swimming technique or the stroking rate or the, or the stroking length changes in the last five meters. I, I don't know. It at least. And I, I'm not sure if there is a, any evidence about that. Uh, tomorrow, uh, one of our, of our colleagues of the Madrid University will, will present her abstract about this topic. This is just a, a small figure about it. And, and here you can see from 2019 World Swimming Championships 100 meters events, the last 25 meters. And you can see the stroking rate of the finalist and semi-finalist in three sections, from 75 to 85, from 85 to 95, and from 95 to 100 to the, to the, to the wall. And we saw that there are no difference in the stroking rate in the last 25 meters. No difference at all, except for backstroke, which makes sense because swimmers do not see the wall. They only see the, the flags. So I think we must, research, uh, we must um, keep, keep looking for, for more rational about this. And, 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 and if there is actually a finished section and, and it's a five meter or shorter or, or longer. Another question is, how can we optimize the, the positive influence of underwater on the subsequent surface swimming? So how can we optimize the breakout or transition phase. Uh, we have done recently some publications about it, but there are still plenty of more questions uh, to solve. And, and we, we know now that the, the body inclination or the body depth at the beginning of the first arm pull out, and even the arm coordination uh, can influence or, or are, are related to the velocity in the first arm stroke cycle from underwater to surface swimming. Another question still to solve related to, to this topic is how changes in underwater swimming affect swimmers? Because in, in training, we say swimmers, we tell swimmers to, to do two more kicks or to emerge after the 15 meter, but we don't know if that affects his or her fatigue. We don't know if doing more kick on the water makes them to have higher lactate or higher heart rate or make them more tired. And that's something that we must uh, rehearse because we, ha we have to train it and we have to know what happens for the swimmers. This is an example of a pilot study we did some months ago where we, we did a training set at 100 meter pace um, and swimmers repeat the, the set three times. The first set was with a free underwater condition. We didn't give gave swimmers any feedback about it. Second set, we told them to do two additional kicks in each uh, turn. There were 20, 75 repeats. And we measure time, we measure uh, lactate, we measure heart rate, we measure rate of perceived uh, resection. And in the third repetition, with complete rest between each repetition, in the third repetition, we asked them to do the maximal and the water distance they, they were able to do. 
but provided they maintain the 200 meter race pace. So I think, uh, I hope in the future we can, I can talk about the, the results of this pilot study and more research, research about the topic. But I think that more questions about this must be, must be answered uh, for coaches and, and, and researchers. Just uh, to finish, uh, a, a suggestion, more, more suggestions for the future. And when will these two images will be available during swimming competitions, both in the pool or, or in open water? I think this is a, an interesting question that I hope that in the future we can, we can solve. We would like to know how many meters open water swimmers uh, really swim during a race. That would be a very nice, very nice uh, uh, questions to know. And we we also want to uh, accurately control where the swimmers emerge during international competitions. Because if you if you saw Olympic Games last summer, you probably realize that sometimes it's difficult to distinguish when the swimmers travel longer or not from from 50 meter and underwater. Uh, that's all. Um, thank you all of you for your attention and, and you are more than welcome to, to, to come to Madrid and, and visit us in our great facilities of the High Performance Center and, and the Faculty of Sports Science. Thank you. So thank you very much, Santiago. Very interesting ideas for the future, <laughs> of course. So any questions, please, if you have previous questions. So. May I go oh. ahead and ask a quick question? Of course, please introduce you. yourself. First of all, sure. my, my name is Sebastian Verde from Costa Rica. Uh, we met Santi in our Alaska level two formally. First of all, let me tell you that your Spanish accent has gone all the way with English, so <laughs> no recognition there on that part, but certainly very interesting what you proposed. Have you considered in any of the studies like the fact of what lane you might be swimming in for that to affect how long you'll be, be swimming underwater, like strategic wise, because some swimmers might change that depending on what lane they're swimming in, or did that not count as a possible variable that might change that? Thank you, Sebastian, for the question and nice to see you again. Uh, we didn't consider the lane. We didn't consider the lane, so we, don't, we didn't examine difference between the lanes. Uh, but this is a, an interesting point to, to, to check. Uh, there, are, there are many, many things that must be checked uh, still. That the length of the swimmers, um, how the position within the race affects them um, uh, for, the, for their underwater, if they are leading the race or, or they are not leading the race. Um, but, but certainly the length could, could, could affect. I don't, I'm not, I, I don't have an answer for that, but that's an interesting point that in the future we could we could examine. So thank you for your suggestion. My pleasure. Thanks for the answer. <laughs> thank you very much. Any more questions? Fine. Thank you very much. Dr. Vega, Santi. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, has been very interesting. And I think there are a lot of <laughs> reflections about your, your speech. Uh, now, so we introduce, I, I will introduce to our final speaker in this first day of our conference. Dr. Robin Pla from France.
Robin has a PhD in sports science. His research work has mainly focused on the analysis of the effects of different training methods and strategies in swimming. Currently, he's working on technical scientific advisors in the French Swimming Federation, I think in an exciting and inspirational period of time for your country, because in three years, you host the Olympic Games. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, with great pleasure that I give you the floor again. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. You can hear me well? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So nice to have a moment to share with, uh, with you uh, uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, regards for my some friends here. <laughs> uh, I will try to, to share my screen. Just a moment. It's okay for you? Yeah? Okay, wonderful. Yes. We can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so as uh, you say, Chema, uh, I will try to present uh, today uh, the horizon for the French Swimming Federation with in mind uh, Paris Olympic Games in 2024. Uh, of course, just three years uh, now, uh, maybe lesser than three years, of course. So a time very short, as you can imagine, uh, but uh, this is the same thing for, for everyone, no? Um, so before to start, I, I, I just wanted to, to precise that I'm not just uh, the only uh, person involved in the performance optimization department in the French Swimming Federation. We are more or less uh, 10 people to, to do that, uh, not 10 people at 10% of uh, action uh, in this area, but still 10 people to, to, to do that. And uh, of course, many partner, university, uh, in the National Institute of Sport, in SEP, and so many others uh, to help us to provide a uh, um, performance system to help on sport coach and coaches and athletes. Uh, because, uh, as I just said before, uh, the number of people involved in this uh, department is, to my opinion, uh, not enough provide good, uh, good help, good support to, to the coaches and the athletes. So that's why uh, during the second part of the presentation, I will present you two projects, two research projects we have with those partners and, uh, because it will help us a lot to, to provide and to propose new solution to, to, to the coaches. Just before I, I will present you uh, some tools, classical tools we are using in the French Swimming Federation, just to give you uh, a little context, of course. Uh, maybe some things will be very clear for you, very simple, not very innovative, but then in the second part, you, you will see maybe some, some new things. But just for you to, to, to know where we are starting, beginning, before the, the Olympics. And because, of course, to, to my opinion, one more time, uh, we are starting too later to be very efficient uh, in three years. Uh, we had one year uh, with COVID and so, so many uh, things running late. You know, uh, it would be, it would have been uh, more favorable to, to have Olympics uh, as Los Angeles uh, four years later. But 
So I will show you some topics you can see here. And as I told you, we will talk about uh, mainly uh, two research projects on our data plan uh, at, the, at the end of the presentation. So um, just as I imagine many of you uh, are using tool to, to, to monitor uh, physiological measures, we, we use to, um, to manage and to monitor earth rate and lactate, uh, root lactate concentration, rating of perceived exertion during incremental tests, uh, as uh, the Portuguese team uh, uh, know very well. Uh, so just to tell you, we are using now uh, a lot uh, Polar OH1 uh, to to uh, to collect health rates, or so we are using also the Garmin belt, Garmin swim belt. Of course, we are doing some work with training load quantification, training volume, intensity distribution. Uh, it's a work with each coach, of course, and we adapt the, the coach uh, uh, requirements uh, depending on their philosophy, of course. Um, we still do some test, technique tests with accelerometer uh, to see uh, the acceleration during, uh, during the race or during the training. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, work with heart rate variability to, to evaluate the wellness states uh, of the athletes, uh, the majority of the of the swimmer are using uh, this tool to to adapt uh, recovery strategy, um, training strategy. Um, we, we are using a lot of this tool in uh, altitude training. Uh, so I, I have no time to, to present you uh, all the data here, but just. For you to know the idea is to tell to the coach, oh, you can push a little bit more, or maybe not. Uh, and of course, it's a, a discussion between coach and me or other sports scientists to evaluate the possibility to train hard or to train a lot, uh, to identify if you are still uh, not acclimated during the beginning of the attitude training camp and so many things. We also uh, developed a project with uh, TANITA uh, to assess body composition. Uh, we have uh, 10 club centers uh, which are equipped from this uh, balance to white balance to, to monitor uh, fat mass, muscular mass, and everything. And we, we have actually uh, a lot of data about that. And of course, we have also questionnaire. We also have a big part with uh, epoxic training. Of course, we have a big center. Maybe the majority of you know well uh, former in the Pyrenees, south of France. Uh, and so we have a protocol to assess and uh, monitor the swimmers during those training camps. We use uh, our trade, SpO2, sleep, hydration, the white. Of course, we have also uh, specific tests before to, to go to the training camp to tell us if we, if we have to, to be more or less focused on every swimmer. And we have the ability to, the, the name is Richelet test. Uh, maybe you know. A lot of uh, articles are, are, are in, the, in the literature. And so we are able to, to know if the swimmer has more or less chances to, to, to acclimate well or not. And of course, we have also um, blood testing before, before the training camp um, and to check uh, iron status. 
we also developed some projects with epoxic tent or epoxic chamber in order to customize more in details uh, the training plan and, the, and to optimize the effects of uh, epoxic training. So now uh, in former you have, uh, I think, uh, more than 10 epoxic chamber to push uh, a bit more the, the altitude elevation. Um, we have also a work about uh, performance modelization. Here we use the Triton wear uh, to collect shock rate, shock uh, length, etc. It's pretty near uh, to the presentation from, from Tanki. Uh, we used this to, to, to modelize performance and to observe uh, stroke changes uh, over the race of our test. For example, here you, you have an example with, uh, with a specific open water 10K uh, tests. Uh, with here, for example, the, the elevation of stroke rate uh, at the end of the, of the race. And of course, we use uh, the data from race analysis to, to identify where the, the, the possibilities could be uh, for, for all swimmers. For example, here, we, we try to illustrate the gaps, differences between Caleb Dressel and Kylie Chalmers uh, during the final of the 100 freestyle in the last world championship. Um, and also we did some statistics as maybe uh, Santi uh, showed just before and to identify um, the characteristics of the best swimmer in the world. And we have also those data for every finalist in the last world championship. We also have a great part of our work about recovery strategy. We estimate uh, fatigue states to adapt recovery. Uh, we are using uh, blood lactate concentration during training, during competition, after the race and after the active recovery in order to, to individualize uh, recovery, active recovery after the race. We also recently, we also used for the management of, of jet lag to Tokyo. We also used uh, the thermoregulation management uh, to assess circadian reason and to, to see if the swimmers was uh, really adapted for, for the jet lag. Uh, the central temperature uh, was a really good tool to have an idea if the swimmers was pretty adapted or not. Um, in that uh, sense, we are providing some advices to manage the travel, the, the training camp before, before the competition. And um, also we have uh, a coordination, of course. We choose to implement osteopathic manipulative treatment when uh, HRV is falling down. And uh, we did not uh, publish uh, anything about that, but I know some something are already in Proven, but uh, for us, it's a very good tool to evaluate uh, the activity of nervous system, the autonomous nervous system, and to to provide a rebound about that with the with the osteopathic manipulative treatment. So it's just. Um, to tell you that, of course, all the recovery protocols are individualized uh, for every swimmer. So, uh, right now, maybe more interesting for you, uh, the presentation of the, um, 
of the Neptune project, which is the first uh, project we have, uh, and we received uh, big fund fundings for, for Paris uh, 2024. Uh, it's all about trimming for this project. Uh, we have a lot of tasks uh, to analyze and to, and to research. The first one uh, I will present to just after is about uh, tracking and racing strategies. Uh, and mainly to, to have possibility, new possibilities to track automatically the, the race segments and the, the stroke characteristic during, during the race or, or during training. Uh, so it's pretty hard, but uh, we're working on that. Uh, another work package about coordination, propulsion, and energetics, and uh, with a um, pretty Sexy tool uh, with underwater part. I will show you just after. And also another work package about uh, active drag and, and drafting and everything. So it is a resume about the, the project. Uh, one rule for, for us is to have uh, every coach are making the decision. Uh, the, the opinion of the Federation and the new uh, performance director Jaco Verharen is not to to standardize a protocol for for all of the swimmers. Uh, the coaches are making the decision. Maybe one coach uh, uh, want to to work on energetics, another one just want to work to underwater, and we have to to, to deal with that. So the first act for us is to develop uh, a tool to track uh, stroke, uh, stroke rate, stroke length for every cycle, uh, and to have, of, of course, velocity uh, for every cycle uh, automatically. So it's not working now. I, I can show you that. But uh, at the moment, we work with two camera, one left camera, one right camera, a fixed camera, not moving. And then uh, our team is able to, to build this image just below here um, and to, to have uh, the possibility to track and to, to recognize, identify uh, every, every stroke for every swimmers. So maybe you, you can have an example E. I don't know if, if I can share that. On Twitter. Up. And then actually we're able to have uh, a line uh, which follows the swimmers. And, and with that line, we're able to, to collect data for every position of the swimming pool on them to have velocity, stroke rate, and everything. So it was the first part. Uh, the second part is to have a fixed system in the National Institute of Sport, uh, which is uh, efficient now, just from a few months. Uh, I don't know if you know the IEM, IAM system, uh, which is able with many camera uh, placed uh, in, the, in the pool. Uh, the system is able to stitch videos so you can follow the swimmers uh, and you can't see that the, the camera are, uh, are different, uh, but uh, very interesting for us to, to collect data automatically and to have, as you can see here, stroke height for every stroke and uh, even uh, velocity. So with that video, uh, you can also have an Excel file with all the, the data. 
we also uh, tested uh, Nicolmantel test uh, to identify the relationship between uh, velocity and stroke rate. And uh, a guy from um, Polytechnique in France uh, now developed a tool to identify uh, automatically uh, where the um, linearity is not anymore uh, seen uh, between uh, the relation between uh, velocity and, and stroke rate. So you have a first regime where velocity and stroke rate are increasing uh, linearly, and then it's not the case. So we can identify uh, uh, character, uh, stroke rate, characteristic stroke rate. Um, Another part of uh, the project is the underwater analysis. Um, we we are oh, sorry. Maybe it's better like that. Um, with the IEM systems, we managed to to have uh, this uh, video stitched. So we are able to have uh, all the underwater uh, part uh, from one screen. And we are able to have uh, data as uh, depth, length, or um, the time at the five meters, the time at 10 meters, at 15 meters. And we can uh, build the trajectory of the underwater part with here each underwater kick. And then we can have the instantaneous velocity here. So this tool is working just from a few weeks. And it's very interesting for us to, to test different uh, start protocol. Or if we want to test, uh, we, you have to do uh, eight underwater kicks of 10, or you have to. To, to break out uh, water after 10 meters or after 12 meters. So it's very interesting for us to have this um, pretty quick feedback to, to, to the swimmer and to the coach. So in, in, it's another idea to, to illustrate uh, the trajectory of the, of the swimmer here with uh, uh, each underwater kick from Maxime Gousset. The other project is the D-Day project, where the goal is to optimize taper with fatigue estimation uh, and appropriate recovery strategy. So um, in this project, we have some, some areas, some topics you can see here. Uh, the rule is not changing. Every coach decides what they want. If one coach just want to, to work on uh, sleep management, just working in sleep management with that coach. Uh, but of course, you can use uh, all of the, of the topic. So the first one is to, to, to have a task on tether swimming. Uh, I think, you know, that kind of, of thing. Uh, but for us, it, it, it not, it's not a biomechanical uh, subject, you know. Uh, it's more uh, to have a specific test on water to estimate wellness states. Um, maybe uh, our hypothesis is with uh, assessment of force production, we can estimate uh, the wellness state of the swimmers. For example, during taper, we can use uh, a rapid test, 10 second test, maximal with maximal intensity to, to assess force production. And our hypothesis is to see uh, if the force production is increasing, maybe you have a better wellness state. So right now we are able to have an immediate feedback with, uh, with that tool. Uh, and we are able to have uh, the overall force, the maximal force, uh, and we can also uh, that um, the decrease of the force production during during the test, which uh, could be also interesting to identify fatigue, of course. 
We also have a lot of uh, testing about recovery strategy with cryotherapy, a trial viability, a specific mattress to, to have better thermoregulation. Of course, we still use uh, cold baths. And the objective is to identify a physiological profile for every swimmer from the French team and to tell us if they agree to tell, or maybe for you, it's better to sleep at uh, 10 hours, or maybe for you, uh, you can not do cryotherapy because I don't know. So big strategy for, for us before Paris is to identify those profiles before, before 2024. We also have another, um, another topic about women's specificity, and uh, especially to, to identify uh, better the hormone profiles. So we are uh, performing some measure to, to identify that. And maybe just to finish, I'm, I'm running late. Uh, we have also a, a, a big um, work about our data plan. We are trying to merging all of our data databases. We, we have a lot, uh, but a lot in uh, a lot of uh, area, a lot of websites, of devices. And so we are trying to to, to merge those database and to use machine learning to correlate or not, or to, to identify relationships between all of these uh, variables and to provide a dashboard to, to the coaches, uh, but also to support staff as physiotherapists, national director, psychologists, etc. So as you can see that too, just an example, that we have a lot of database and some of them, uh, we need to, to improve it. Uh, an example uh, with those data could be to uh, use performance uh, trajectories to, to improve our capacity uh, about uh, talents, about detection. Uh, we have the, the, the opportunity to use all of the all of the data, the, the race data we have, the race times we have in the French Swimming Federation. I think it's like more than 10 million, uh, 10 billion data, uh, so pretty, pretty important. And then now uh, maybe you can see that website. Uh, I can try just uh, two minutes to show you. Uh, we have those dashboards about many databases. We use uh, the Fusion software uh, named Athlet uh, 360. Uh, and so we are able to have in the same platform many topics uh, to, to identify uh, the data about each swimmer. So it's just the beginning of the project right now, but the objective is to have all of our data in the same platform. Then I think Okay, for me, thank you for your attention. I hope it was pretty clear. So if you have a question, I'm available to, to answer you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pla. Very interesting speech about how you are, how your federation is currently monitoring the the whole variables who intervene in the performance of a swimmer. So next, anyone has a question? Um, okay, Santi, you first. No, no. 
Do you go? Okay. Uh, I already introduced myself. So, um, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, maybe I, I missed during the presentation, but what was the rationale for this project? Did you see a similar uh, how the idea to put so so many to say different things in one platform? So there was a little of noise. Yeah. You can repeat. Yes, it's, it's really it's a really huge project, and it's in yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Many many things still need to be developed, and yeah. and uh, also like communication with coaches as well. So yeah. one question was the. I will I will ask later one more question, but this is just one general. How how did you come to this idea, and did, yeah, you, did it, you see any similar in other sports? Yeah, okay, it's very good question and maybe very interesting for for a lot of researchers here because of course uh, there are two big projects, more than one million euros uh, given. Uh, so good for us because. A lot of money, a lot of uh, possibilities, but of course, it's very, very difficult to me and to the federation to manage that. Uh, first, because sometimes, as you know, it's difficult to um, catch uh, the goals of the researcher from university um, with the coaches. It, it, it could be difficult to uh, to have the same calendar, to have the same goals, to 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 talk the same uh, words uh, and the other uh, thing of course uh, as you said is very difficult to communicate well and regularly about that so uh, step by step uh, we I think we are doing pretty well uh, but it, it's very difficult and of course I think uh, we will not able to use all the things uh, in that project before Paris. A lot of things uh, will not be able to, to be used. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of slides where, where you talk about like uh, coach decision. Is it just, uh, who, who proposed it? Is it just some pure example without real, 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 um, is it really re reflecting the, the coach choose or is it just some random example not really connected to, to the... Because coach usually plan their trainings according to this m m micro and cycles and so on. So, so uh, sorry, I, I, I'm maybe I'm not sure. Is it just some some random example, not, not really the real... The real um, reflections of, of coach choose that I'm not sure whether my question is clear. Uh, so I, I can try to, to, to answer if I well understood, but uh, uh, yes, the rule for us is to tell coaches are making the decision. And as I told before, uh, we, we, we will not uh, uh, implement a mandatory thing. Uh, okay. But uh, we did a conference about that project uh, at the beginning of the season uh, to the coaches. Uh, and after that, the coaches can tell us uh, if they want to do some uh, topics or not. So right now, it's more to, to the coaches to tell us if they want to do underwater uh, test or incremental test or tester swimming. So yeah, but of course, uh, we will propose some things which uh, are very interesting to, to our opinion. Okay, okay, now it's more clear to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Jose, can I ask a question, please? Of course. <laughs> uh, Jose, yeah. Uh, Thanks for that. And thanks very much for the presentation, Robin. Very interesting. Um, my question kind of relates a little bit to the question from Yelena and the idea that coaches will be able to choose which of these interventions and tools that they use. 
when you come to the end of the cycle, if you have lots of different things being tried by different people, how will you be able to determine what has been effective? Um, and therefore, how will that inform what you do in the next cycle? Uh, what do you mean about cycle? Sorry? Uh, Olympic cycle. Ah, Olympic cycle. Okay. So, yeah, pretty difficult because, of course, it's a three-year cycle. <laughs> so, I don't know if I understood well the question, but, uh, of course, uh, some groups will use just technique assessment, some of the just physiological assessment. Um, I think we are not, I think in general, uh, our organization is not prepared to respond very regularly to national groups because we are not enough. So of course, some of groups are using other expertise, uh, like Jan Olbrecht, or I don't know, for physiological testing, you know. Uh, so we are trying to make more sense about the Federation supports. But right now, I can really answer the, the question. But of course, uh, the main thing for me is, is, is to have better communication uh, to tell, oh, you can do that whenever you want, uh, and to have um, uh, an, organi an organization, a project, you know, framework to, to organize well the, the different tasks. I don't know if I answer very well. No, that, that's, that's really good, thanks. I think, I think you have a big challenge with so much data and so many different yeah. things going on, it's going to be very challenging. But yeah, I, I really, really value the insight that you gave. Thank you. Yeah, because maybe to, to answer a, a bit more, uh, I think uh, maybe some other here can, can answer too, maybe. But in France, we do not have a center with biomechanic expert or, or, or physiological expert. We just have strength and conditioning coach, maybe a psychologist or a medical doctor, but we don't have a sports scientist directly uh, involved in a center. And that's why it's also difficult to us to, to maintain a big uh, confidence uh, between federation and, and coaches. Okay. Fine. So I have an, uh, also a specific question about the data anal analysis. So do you manage a lot of data, of my colleague said? So what kind of statistical analysis do you, do you use for determining the best variables? Regression models, artificial neural networks, what kind of things or uh, what yeah. are your preliminary what is your preliminary results about this management of this complete uh, complete and uh, complex analysis yeah the, thank you the, the final goal for us could be to uh, to have a system with machine learning to automatically treat data even I am not very confident about that, but maybe it can still work. I read some good thing from Australian Swimming Federation. Uh, so it would be a goal, but uh, it's a, 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 there are many topics, you know, because for HRV, uh, day by day, we are not uh, really performing statistics. We, we do not use p-value, we don't use, do not use regression. But of course, we can um, we can have more developed uh, work with uh, the performance times. We we, we run we run a, uh, a thesis about uh, performance trajectory with a mathematical model that we developed. I can I cannot answer you very <laughs> very precisely about that. Uh, but I mean. For the, the, the things we are uh, using very regularly with coaches, they are, 
they are, they are not very, they're not so much statistics. Okay. But of course, for research projects, we use uh, more developed uh, uh, statistics, but it's very different depending on the topic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's a fantastic project. So our colleagues from France are now <laughs> developing. So now, thank you very much. The, our final meeting is a, is a private session with the founder members of the network. So the rest of attendance, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, see you tomorrow, which with more swimming science. And uh, to our colleagues, see you now in our specific room for for the meeting. So thank you very much. Uh, see you in a bit in the <laughs> next room. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye.